Dark Souls 2, the awkward middle child of the Souls games, is often shunned by the community at large. However, we both actually find it dead in the middle of our ranking of the Souls games, above Demon Souls and the original Dark Souls, but below Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne. But just how much of our enjoyment comes from the boss fights? That's the question we'll answer today. This is going to be a long one, so sit back and enjoy. If you were expecting it, I got nothing to say besides I'm sorry, I'm not going to go on the usual worst boss rant, rather I'm just extremely disappointed. Lud and Zalan are Ava, with black fur, heavier weapon degradation, and a bullshit self buff that makes them practically unkillable for like a minute 30 and change. For note, Ava is way higher on the list, and even though she's not particularly good, the only reason the pets of the Ivory King lap everybody else out for the bottom spot is the hellish North Pole nightmare that is the frigid outskirts. No bonfire, 5 minute run up minimum, and infinitely spawning lightning reindeer that given a bit bigger of a health bar would properly qualify as their own boss fight. On top of all that, let's add the durability farming, head exploding, vigor breaking reskin as the finisher to a $10 DLC, and now you get why these guys are so commonly loathed by the entire community. Well, I'm basically ranting now, but yeah, with no new mechanics and a change in run up from literally nothing to the longest and most treacherous I've ever played before, Ludd and Zalan are lucky the Bed of Chaos blows so much ass, as otherwise they would far and away be the worst boss in video game history. Once again, the rotten filth of Souls 2's DLC rears its ugly head. This one isn't quite in the same league as Ludd and Zalan, but it's still pretty repulsive. It's literally just three NPCs, who aren't even new, ganking you in a big open room. It's not the worst arena ever at least, it having two levels adds some strategy to the fight, but that's not something that ever crosses my mind in the moment at all, because I'm too busy getting harassed by infinite stamina havel and being pelted by great arrows from across the room. The way it usually plays out is you run like hell, and once their varying run speeds distance them apart you can get some shots in on the fastest guy but a stray arrow can easily throw that strategy out of whack. You'd think going after the Lucetil clone would be the best move since that's the ranged fighter of the group, but I never found that too viable since the melee guys will just jam their swords up your asshole if you ignore them for more than like 5 seconds. This fight and its miserable, wretched run-up are one of the most dreaded parts of any full playthrough of the game for me. The Cave of the Dead is just a horrifying labyrinth of petrifying statues and dead ends. The only reprieve here is that this fight is optional and you don't even get a boss soul, so there's essentially no reason to even bother with it in the first place. If you haven't ever fought these guys, just take our word for it that that's probably for the best. If you haven't caught on, optional mediocre boss fights plus abhorrent run-ups are a recipe for disaster, and the Executioner's Chariot suffers the same fate. That being said, I will give it the fact that it's extremely unique. The Executioner rides on his chariot and they revolve around a circular dome, apparently custom fit because it's tight. So tight, you need to rely on the safe spots placed around the edges of the arena for cover. Main issue, there's two blocks of skellies and they infinitely respawn unless you knock out their respective necromancers. And while they can also be hit by the chariot, they don't die in one go and once again don't die anyway, so if you stay put for even more than an extra second you'll get trapped and need a bit of luck to get out. To actually stop the chariot, you need to reclose the gate that was open during the intro. After you close the gate, the horse will smash into it, killing the executioner and dealing a bit of damage in the process. You can also take it down through a separate, albeit more time consuming way, either through arrows, pyromancy, or sorceries while camping in a crevice. This makes the horse slip up on the jump and eventually hang on by a thread like Caesar's Discharge and you hit it for the win. Nobody ever does that though, and there's no real point because the dual helmed horse isn't even terrible, it's mainly just lame. It relies on delayed head thrusts and the occasional hex, but it's low health and along with the minimum 3 or 4 hits you get from recovering, it'll go down with the breeze. The Bell Gargoyles in Dark Souls 1 are one of our favorite bosses. These guys are, well, basically the same. Why is this fight so dog shit then? Well, there are a few caveats. For one, you're not just dealing with Thing 1 and Thing 2 here, but this time the entire bell tower's supply of living gargoyles is in stock, and they all have a vested interest in molesting the bearer of the curse with an endless barrage of halberd swings and flames. This is just one of the most chaotic fights I've played in any game, period. 
They don't even give you the grace of having a reasonable amount of time to take out the first gargoyle. After like 10 or 15 seconds, the second one drops in and they keep that pace steady. By the time you've killed maybe one, you'll be up against an unholy swarm of the things. Frankly, I think you could make a case for these guys being even worse than the gank trio, but I find this boss a bit easier and the run-up is way less horrible, so it's overall not as irritating. That said, I'm by no means a Belfry Gargoyle apologist. This boss was a shameless rip-off attempting to invoke nostalgia, but rather than being merely an offensive rehash, it's also a frustrating piece of shit fight. The true boss of this fight is the rats. They have ridiculous toxic buildup and can kill you before the fight even begins, whether that be literal or through toxic. When you first enter, the authority is asleep and his four cronies serve as the appetizer. You get about 5 seconds to kill him before the big boy hops in and good luck. Toxic is beyond overpowered and trying to balance consistent health depletion, 2-3 to three fast moving rats, not to mention a gigantic rat dog is as good as impossible. If you do manage to kill the base enemies, he's not too bad in his own. I called him a rat dog because he's got the same moveset as Sif from Dark Souls just without the sword or the flips. He hits about average for a mid to late game boss and has fair tells with the exception of those really overdue swings, but yeah, the rats make this quite the nuisance, even with the bonfire right outside and due to being plain unfair, a slot even this high up should be gracefully accepted. If you haven't noticed, every single boss thus far has been optional. It really is a weird trend, but it's one I'm thankful for nonetheless, because I know for a fact that if I had to fight the Ancient Dragon every single time I played the game, it'd really take the wind out of my sails. Jack and I are pretty good at this fight now actually and rarely die, but your first go at this hulking damage sponge will likely inspire murderous rage. He has more health than like, the entire first half of the game's bosses put together, and can kill you pretty quickly if you don't play your cards right. Sometimes, it's not even about something on your end at all, and he decides to just set up camp near the edge of the platform like a dickhead. In this case, there really isn't a lot of things you can do other than hope he moves. It sort of happened in my fight shown here, but in Jack's, he literally had two feet just off the edge. If he happens to do his flying fire attacks, you're good as fried. Just pray that you have enough health to tank it since you can't just walk on air and run towards his tail. This is an endurance fight if there ever was one. He's pretty sluggish in speed, so you've got plenty of time to heal and get your licks in. And the run-up feels like it's designed to piss you off. If you don't kill the night guys, the mini Ornsteins become hell-bent on hunting you down, and you likely won't even make it back to the fog gate. So if you happen to get one shot or something by the dragon, enjoy the minimum 5 minute run-up, you poor sucker. At least he isn't a gank and is pretty doable if you're on your A game, but that's pretty much the bare minimum, so he's still hot garbage. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, well, in this case, shame on you again. The Royal Rat Ra <sighs> The Royal Rat Vanguard is equally terrible to the other Trial of the Rat King, and just like its larger than life counterpart, the key is elemental damage. The base rats deal petrify, albeit in slim margins, but come in infinitely spawning groups of about 10, and I guess I lied, your actual health should be your concern. They can stack up a massive stunlock if cornered or trapped on a rat statue and actually sauce out pretty high damage for an early fight. I'm not sure whether it's timed or based on the number of rats you take down, but after a little while of vermin smashing, the big boy hops in and he's discernible by three things. A larger health pool, the highest elemental infliction in the series, that being four fifths of your toxic safety net, and a pretty gnarly mohawk. He goes down with ease, literally 4 or 5 hits if you're rocking a blunt weapon, but as previous has a rat militia as backup and if you don't play cautiously your health bar will go down the drain. As yet another objectively easy fight, the insurmountable levels of bullshit at play that serve as a caveat for lazy and uninspired designs surely make this protector of the rat king deserving of a low spot. Did you like the Dragon Rider boss fight? Not really? Well that's too bad, now fight two of them because f you. The good news is that this fight is like taking a piss. Easy for everyone but people with Parkinson's. The bad news is that it's like, pretty boring. Once you knock down the archer he's good as dead, he's got half the health the normal one does not to mention extremely weak armor, and that leaves you in a one on one with the same chump you probably dunked on back at Hyde's Tower of Flame. It goes exactly how you'd expect, with him dying in a similarly swift manner. 
This boss is lazy as hell, but it's not really annoying either, so I'd say this is the point where bosses go from straight trash to just eh. I'd still take these goofs over the Royal Rat Vanguard any day. With this, I'd say we're officially out of the crap territory. Prowling Magus and Congregation are second only to pin me over the title of easiest boss in the Souls game. They're one of those fights that exist more as pieces of lore over deeply intuitive mechanical encounters as literally everything in here is repasted from the main game except the Prowling Magus. The Congregation can do nothing but swing around as they're just plain old hollows, the priests shoot miniature bolts of lightning and heal the Magus, and Prowling Magus has an AoE and a scythe. In terms of movesets, that's it, but on a side note, there are benches at the back of the arena that provide really good crowd control and blockage from the priests. But yeah, once again, that's it, however, lore-wise, it gets deep. The Congregation is what's left of the survivors of Seldora Cove. When the Duke's dear Freya was overcame by the remnants of Seath's soul, the mining colony was put into disarray and called for the Drangliak Royal Army. Along with it came a few priests, such as the two seen here, who provided aid and healing to the survivors. While it's unclear how or when the Prowling Magus arrived, he took over the congregation and up to that point, with help from the priests, was using the weakened and vulnerable Seldorians as a way to obtain souls. So, from a neutral stance, either you're putting these poor guys out of their misery, or mass killing an innocent crowd of demonic war survivors. Yeah, I know, I just forever change your outlook on this fight. You're an asshole, but at the same time, a free 7k souls and a titanite slab are a bargain no sane man could pass up. I felt it was fair to save talk about the Dragon Rider's actual moves for the solo match. Not to say it's really a deep well of commentary. He, uh, swings at you. That's about it. I've actually had a pretty embarrassing match with him here and got beamed a few times, but the only real danger in this fight is falling off the edge. You can raise the platform's outer part with a lever outside the arena, which largely mitigates this pitfall, but that also takes away your ability to watch him fall to his own death. This boss is in the same camp as the Iron Golem from Souls 1 for me, and that I just see him as sort of a goof. It's not very fun or exciting, but there are ways to get a laugh at his expense, so it's not totally barren of enjoyment. Yeah, you know what? I'm sick and tired of hearing how, oh, the Covetous Demon's a piece of cake, he's a pushover, he's a goofball, because, hello, it's not like he doesn't dish out half your health per hit and actually moves deceptively fast considering he's a massive blubber and chub. <sighs> but I'll cave the commonality and say, for the most part, he is easy because he's fat and in turn very slow. And this is why he's so high up, because he wasn't always this large. If anything, he was a normal sized dude with a deep affection for Mytha and decided, no, I'm not gonna make a move, I'll flatter her by eating such an obtuse load of grub that I'll literally transform into a demon. And his unquenchable famine plays a role in the fight, as he has an attack wherein he eats you, de-equipping all your items in the process and spitting you back out butt naked. You can also buy yourself some hits by slotting a crossbow and a couple iron arrows, as you can shoot vases hanging from the ceiling that hold undead. He totally drops the idea of killing you, and as much as I think those dudes had it better off endlessly hanging from a ceiling, this is the best easter egg in the game, so it's a fair trade in my eyes. The comedic aspect of this fight definitely plays a role in our appreciation of this Lord of Lard, and while he's nothing above okay, he's enjoyable and a hell of a laugh, so amen to that. This is one boss Jack and I do not agree on at all. I think most people side with Jack here and say this boss is insufferable garbage. I think most of the points people make to that end are valid enough, like the AoE when he spawns in being occasionally unfair, and the fire around him coming back too quickly. And I don't really have a rebuttal or anything, I just don't get too bothered by those things. The AoE has never personally screwed me over that hard, and I think it's fair enough that he catches fire quickly, since if he didn't the fight would be way too short for a final boss. I'm not trying to say he's a master class in boss design or anything, but I think he's fairly inoffensive and milk a toast. He at least requires conscious effort which puts him above brain dead bosses like old Jabba the Hutt down in 31st place for me. Although I do admit that I have no idea why he fights you. It can't be that he's like testing you or something because he should obviously know he's weaker than people you've beat before him and you just beat everyone you could if you did an all boss run. And if you have the same goal as him, why even bother? If he wants you to kill him, why put up a fight? 
Based off his dialogue, he seems like a Camus-style absurdist with all his talk of the meaningless cycle and all that, so I guess he just doesn't really care what happens in the end. Probably for the best that this talking firewood was put to rest. Fair warning, this would have been higher with a cutscene. Who am I kidding, Najka's no Quelag, if anything she tried, from the braless body covered by hair to the animal torso with magical powers in the bottom. Similar to Quelag, she sticks to physical attacks with both her scythe and pincers, but on occasion uses homing soul arrows which are killer if all five connect. The pincers work like tails in that they can be cut off through ample damage and provide large windows of opportunity through floor stabs. At around half health she goes underground for 15 seconds, take it or leave it, and pops up at random dealing huge damage if she lands it. Sounds kinda bullsh**, but the arena design is on point. The keen eye would notice the remnants of a ruined building, and standing on this makes you completely unhittable from her heaviest attack, and it also gives 4 free hits from recovery time. Already I'd argue we're moving out of the questionable tier into the bland region, where there's nothing overtly bad, nor anything terrifically done. Najka's about as mediocre as possible, but enjoyable enough, so even at this low of a ranking, I've got respect. The way I see it, this guy is basically the last giant but cooler, since he has a sword, exploding crap in his arena, and so on. Although, Jack made a good point to me that the last giant ripping off his arm to use as a weapon is way cooler than the sword. I'll save the rest of the comparisons for the last giant segment, but I will admit that I was sorta of swayed by that argument. Plus the giant lord's move pool feels smaller to me, so it's less interesting. This fight is just some good old classic ankle biting. My brother saw me fighting this guy and the ancient dragon and asked me if every boss in this game was just hitting people's ankles, which was sort of funny to me because I started thinking about how many bosses follow that rule. Repetitive as this fight may be, it's sort of cool plot wise and has a memorable arena, so I give it a few graces. You most likely fought this guy in the early game at the Cathedral of Blue and straight up the all the keep version is much easier. The arena is one of my favorites visually and is also gigantic, whereas in early game it's a small circular area that you can easily fall off if cornered. Also, this dude has insanely weak defense and, like most dragons, gets crushed by gold pine resin. He's also the first boss in the series to take headshot damage, I think, and as seen here if you bait the straightaway you can get 2 or 3 hits worth double damage with relative ease. While mechanically there's not a ton going on, he has a few interesting attacks such as the one where he clings to the cage and spits out an AoE fireball and even though I couldn't get footage, you can chop off his tail as well. While being quite primitive for a dragon fight, the guardian dragon stands out in some departments and does nothing offensively bad. Nice. Ah, good old foreskin demon. Here's another goof category boss for the list, which seems to largely consist of Souls 2 bosses now that I think about it. To be blunt, this fight is piss easy. His stubby little arms can only really get you a point blank range, and his only move that could be considered range is a super high jump that's pretty hard to get hit by. I find him kind of fun, partly because of his funny looks, but also since I just enjoy it for some reason I can't put to words. He's pretty creative design wise for sure. One thing I never got is if it's him singing or the Milfonto. Logic says it's the Milfonto, but he is called the Demon of Song, so it also stands to reason that he can sing as well. Hell, maybe it's both of them. Pleasant enough to hear and eases the suffering of the Shrine of Amana at least. He's pretty simple so I can see him ranking low for some people, but he's got enough going on to be decently unique in my opinion. The Throne Watcher and Defender are like pre-alpha designs of Ornstein and Smo, with the Defender the slower and heavier hitting one while the Watcher is more quick and agile. Sounds similar? It should, because these guys are yet another example of a Dark Souls rehash, and like the others they're missing a key element of what made the originals great, this time the arena and specifically the pillars for crowd control. The Throne of Want is literally a rundown floor that breaks off early, nothing in it, nothing to it. That definitely hurt the fight, not to mention they have minimal lore significance. Long story short, one watches the throne and one defends it and both are deeply influenced by the Abyss. It is somewhat interesting how the way they fight represents their positions in lore though, as the defender is generally passive while the watcher is very aggressive, pushing on irritatingly aggressive. 
I always take down the defender first as he's got more health, but make sure you chip damage on both before taking one out. Both have a revival ability that takes about 5 seconds, but respawns their partner at full health and such as what happened on my first playthrough creates an infinite loop. This mechanic is more on the bullshit side, but rarely ever plays a factor as a bright bug and a plus 10 weapon should do the trick just fine. As one of the final bosses in the game, they were surely disappointing, but on the grand scope, mediocre movesets and interesting design make for a mid-table placement. Remember Lud and Zalin at the beginning of the video? Yeah, it's them, but way, way, way less horrible. This time there's only one of them, he doesn't obliterate your weapon durability, and doesn't have the frigid outskirts as a lead-up. It's still not that fun in my opinion, but it's a far cry from the agony of the Ivory King's other pets. I have a little reserved bitterness towards this boss for being the only one in the game I can't beat at soul level 1 due to the horrible shit boxes of the swipe, but since we're talking about a normal run with higher adaptability, I can't knock it for that. It gives good healing windows at least whenever it runs away from you, but it can be annoying if you have full health because it just feels like it's drawing stuff out, especially if it happens a lot in succession. The delay on the swipes is pretty tricky, which I think is done poorly in this case. Delayed attacks can spice up a fight by punishing roll spam if it's still telegraphed to an extent. For an example, a slow sword swing or visibly charging magic or something. However, Ava just sits still for a moment and then randomly paws at you after around 2 seconds or so. It's a game of chicken that you can't really win other than just guessing, which shouldn't be part of a fight at all in a Souls game. It's worth noting that if you fight Ava without the Priestess's eye, it's invisible, which is sort of cool I guess, although no one in their right mind would ever bother to fight it this way. This fight has enough mechanical depth to be engrossing, but some mild irritations keep it back from the upper ranks. The Fallen King of Drangliak is the Gwyn of Dark Souls 2 from a lore perspective. Vendrick was influential to all aspects of the game, whether it be Aldia's exile to his keep, the giant sieges, the defeat of the Great Ones, refusing to relink the First Flame, and even Nishandra's manipulation. And most importantly to this fight in specific, by not linking the flame, Vendrick eventually went hollowed while in exile at the undead crypt. This is where you find him, overrun by hollowing and a mere shell of what he once was. I'm pretty sure he doesn't even recognize your existence when you first enter his safe room, as you can literally hit him and he'll stay passive. From a gameplay standpoint, however, this is because he has a built-up defense through giant souls, unusable souls obtained by going through optional sections that each deplete 20% from his defense. There's five across the game, three from each giant memory in the forest, one from the twin giants in the black gulch, and the f***ing ancient dragon. The irony of these things is that all five individually are more difficult to get than Vendrick himself. He can't do anything besides awkwardly irk his sword directly in front of him and he has no way of protecting his backside other than jumping away. Sticking to his butt makes it a piece of cake, and with all five giant souls, he's on the lower side of health anyways. From once great ruler to now hollowed zombie, King Vendrick, former King of Drangliak, is a memorable character with an average boss battle. Pretty weird seeing this guy so far from the giant lord, huh? That's the magic of the rank averaging process in action. Jack sees a much wider discrepancy in quality than I did, and we ended up deciding on a spot just around the middle. This was the first real boss Jack beat in a Souls game, in a functional run, since when he fought the Asylum Demon it was just me getting him to play the game on my laptop at a friend's house in 8th grade. So that's the source of his fondness for this big lunk. I played Souls 2 way after I played the others, so I was a hardened veteran already and put him down with callous disinterest. I can't appreciate him now though, since he is a good first boss. The face plant attack, which I sadly did not record, sadly did not record, sadly did not record, sadly did not record. Him ripping off his arm was also pretty metal, although I'm not sure why he thought that made sense. It's not a range problem he needed to address, it's an aim one. This fight would be a lot harder if he figured out how to move his arms between his legs, but also probably way more annoying, so I'm thankful for his stupidity. Bosses who affect or are affected by mechanics outside their respective fight are really cool. In terms of Mytha and the Earthen Peak as a whole, there's a windmill that when lit by torch removes all poison in the surrounding area. 
If you don't like the windmill as shown here, the entire room is filled up to shin height and poison, providing a consistent healing source for Mytho all while poisoning you as well. I'd say a good 100% of Dark Souls 2 players like the windmill, so the poison doesn't play much into the fight other than being a fun little splotch to hop over at the beginning, but it is interesting how she technically has multiple fights. Mytha similar to Najka in that no, 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 not because she's yet another brawless woman with an apex predator body, but rather she makes use of a scythe and sorcery depending on how far away you are. Up close, she rarely, if never, uses magic and relies on I believe to be undodgeable tail whips, grabs, and basic swings. From a distance, she shoots magic beams and throws her head, not kidding, which acts as a decoy for a really powerful AoE. Once again, she's not flashy or even particularly notable, but Mytha gets the job done and is a good enough time to crack into the top half of the list. As the first Lord Soul boss fight to come up, we have the old Iron King. He's a pretty awesome character lore-wise, probably one of the most relevant in Dark Souls 2 at least. This boss is called the Old Iron King, but is actually Icarus Earth, a creature formed by the Old Iron King and Gwyn's soul. How Gwyn's soul ended up here is anyone's guess, but it sure made him look pretty cool at least. The big danger here is the huge lava lake surrounding the arena. He's a big sluggish oaf, but if he manages to connect something on you, you're going flying. If you are one of the poor suckers who fell for the just stay in the area by the arena exit strategy, you're good as dead. I've been sent flying back three times by the same attack to my death there before. It's a total scam, do not do that. I died in this fight twice while trying to do my no death no bonfire run and both times were because I got trapped in that little ledge. The hole in the main area is scary, sure, but you have ample room to work with and can avoid it as long as you're quick and careful. A lot of people trash in this fight, but I honestly think it's sort of fun. It's definitely unique and it's got an awesome backdrop and design. The lava bath deaths can feel cheap and unfair, but with the insane wind-up time for his attacks, the old Iron King deserves a little help, I'd say. I of course wish the fight was done differently, but I don't think that this is at all the worst thing we could have gotten out of him. Listen, I really don't care about Nishandra, I just feel terrible for Vendrick. He got mercilessly baited, not only in the looks department, but also because she used him as a tool to gain power and eventually corrupt Drangliak. As most fights in the game go, Nishandra's mechanics correspond to her lore. The fight revolves around Curse and Hex, as she's one of the spawns of Manus, and is more so a game of balancing hollowing over the usual punishing and low acquittal endgame boss. She's really easy. Arguably too easy for the climax, but once again the curse orbs are the true challenge. At the beginning, then at other random intervals over the course of the fight, Nishandra summons four evenly spread curse orbs that drain your hollow meter when in range and naturally deplete your health. This in turn makes her more dangerous simply due to a slimmer health pool and her hex attacks are normally high damage anyways. The laser, while being very dodgeable and straightforward, is top notch damage and the AoE is no different. The scythe has decent power, but only swings around her feet, so any forward motion puts you out of range, and I also think it's really cool how she has two unique cutscenes, one after you beat the Throne Watcher and Defender, and one if you re-enter after dying. As the original final boss of the game, Nishandra is pretty good, and I'd say is the first boss where nothing sticks out as even mildly blasphemous, so let's be happy that we're finally entering the good zone. I see a lot of fans for this boss, and I actually used to be one, but the more I played the game, the more I realized this boss is pretty irritating to me. For starters, you can fight her in the dark or with light, but the process of lighting the torches is so lengthy that it isn't really worth it, and I only did it to get footage here. If it's dark, which is how it usually is, your lock-on has greatly reduced functional range, which is a big pain. She also is really jumpy. If you like using slow heavy weapons like I do, you've likely experienced the rage that comes when you dodge an attack, take a swing, and she jumps back and then comes at you while you already have low stamina. I think no boss should punish you for your weapon choice like this, and it strikes me as BS whenever it happens. That said, she still has cool elements to her. She's got a unique moveset with the sword and has a distinct movement style. As long as she plays fair and doesn't get too dodge happy, it's a fun, fair clash. The cutscene also has a nod to the bed of chaos and shows a chaos bug crawling up into the poor woman's eye socket. It may not be my favorite fight, but it's a pretty big improvement over the bed, so at least the Witch of Isolith Soul learned a valuable lesson over the many years between Souls 1 and 2.
Whether he's a reincarnation, an imposter, or truly Ornstein himself, the old Dragon Slayer is not that much like his so-called carbon copy. <clears throat> besides how he magically shares the exact same weaponry and armor. Also, Ornstein is a half of one of the best boss fights of all time, so why complain anyways? Nonetheless, their respective movesets and lore differs enough to quantify them as unique and enjoyable in their own rights. The old Dragon Slayer is imbued with Dark, and his moveset is based on Dark Magic and Quick Thrust. Like many humanoids in the game, he gets cheesed through right strafing, but he makes up ground with AoEs like the Booty Stomp. He's part of Hyde's Tower of Flame, so he's an early game boss, and due to that he has low health and mid damage. Also, to be completely honest, the run up is more difficult. Fuck that dragon, and fuck, fuck, fuck that spear guy. I'm getting off topic, but the old Dragon Slayer is a fun remix of a great boss, and while it shows how much easier Ornstein and Smo are individually, he was a jolly good time and I commend the developers for changing it up. This boss is really creative. The only problem I have is that it's too damn easy and I killed it way too fast in my run to appreciate it. So I fought him again in the Sinner's Rise to pad this segment a bit. Anyways, if you couldn't tell, it's basically two conjoined lizard twins in armor who can fight you in both directions. One's got clubs and one's got curved swords. The club side is way easier to deal with, so you want to stay facing that half of the century. A neat mechanic in the No Man's Wharf encounter is that the water level slowly rises over time and eventually will start slowing you and your rolls. If he had a health bar bigger than a thimble, this would actually be pretty awesome and add some serious intensity to the fight and make for a pretty unorthodox encounter. Sadly, he's usually down for the count before more than a leader or two can trickle in. Arena design, complex movesets, and enemy placement. Three feats accomplished by the Rune Sentinels that nobody seems to pay attention to. You enter the fight through what I'm guessing was a blown open door and drop onto a ledge with the Rune Sentinel waiting. The inexperienced player would panic and drop down, but you're intended to fight him up there. By staying on the ledge, you keep him solo, and with a decently upgraded weapon and some good old sticky white stuff, you can knock him out pretty quick. For note, by dropping into the main foreground, the other two sentinels, who you can spot at other points throughout the arena, can just drop down with you and join in, rather than traverse the whole thing and jump up to the ledge separately. What I recommend is kill the first one, wait for the second, and get in as much damage as you can before the third one joins in, as it gets way too cramped up there for a crowd of three. If, and only if, you're really overleveled, you can take out all three individually, but on a normal new game cycle, you most likely don't have the necessary damage output, so you should try to drop down with the first one dead and the second at about half health. They also have really cool movesets that utilize their long range weapons and athleticism, and have shields used both defensively and offensively, with the latter removing it from the field of play when used. Sure, there is no difference among the three, but as a whole, the complexity and unique spin on the standard gank makes these three guardians of… the bonfire I guess, special and quite memorable. I used to hate this boss, and those of you who saw our Dark Souls 1 ranking could guess why. The mini spiders all over the arena when the fight starts. I detest bosses that fight you with enemies, so why do I like this fight? For one, you can bring a torch. This scares off the spiders and effectively nullifies them, letting you kill them or ignore them at your discretion. Once they're out of the picture, the big spider itself is actually pretty fun. I like how it's got two heads, which means it's always open to a hit if you make a run around during another attack. You do need to attack from a perfect angle though, or the armor on the sides dinks your sword like a plaything. This guy is more of an armor spider than the armor spider itself, ironically, and thankfully vastly superior. The laser attack is pretty cool. You can roll through it if you're really good, but I just run away from it usually. Sometimes it'll throw a fit and stomp around and puke everywhere, which is avoidable by just hanging back. This boss is pretty creative and has a wide original moveset, so I can't help but to have fun with it now. I'm not exactly sure about the consensus on this guy, but I got a feeling most don't like him. For us, the rotten checks out in everything except maybe the arena. The layout is very questionable with the burning oil and limits your space to work with, but is a necessary addition in my opinion as he's easy peasy with ample flooring. The rotten similar to the adjudicator not only in silhouette, but telegraphs. His swings are slow, but his returns are fast and the difference in delay can make it sketchy. A very unnoticeable mechanic that's worthy of appreciation is Pharos. 
Well, the rotten is Faros, hence the statues in the Black Gulch and why he spurgs when the statue's head falls off, but the mechanic I'm talking about is that guy, who's presumably Faros as an undead. He mimics the Rotten's attacks before he actually does them, like Pontiff Sullivan's Phantom, but harmless. And among other things, he's fair. His damage output is among the best in the game corresponding to his placement in the story, so as Repent, most of his attacks when dodged give a window of a guaranteed two hits. And like I said, both his arms are choppable, and when he's got nothing but stubs, all the vegetable can do is puke up corrosive acid and swing around what he's got left. He does grow them back eventually, but by that point, and with the damage dealt beforehand, this goofy clump of body should be put out for good. This is our obligatory weird ranking for the video. I really, really like the Skeleton Lords. Sure, they're sort of a throwaway boss, but that might be part of why I like them. I've already mentioned the elusive goofball status a few times, and this boneheaded trio are the kings of that domain. One thing that helps them out a lot is the fact that it's pretty hard to end it quickly. It's a piss-easy fight that you would probably have to intentionally die in, but the unique way it's designed is an effective safeguard against the pitfalls bosses like the Covetous Demon fall into where they die too fast to even be funny. Killing each lord is hardly time-consuming, but their deaths spawn an army of normal skellies to avenge them in their wake. This doesn't happen instantly, but rather after a few seconds pass. So you could kill one lord, and then while you're tangoing with another, the first one's minions come up. Skeletons are much better enemies in Souls 2 than 1 in my opinion, since they're less in your face and specifically the bone wheels got nerfed to oblivion. It's a fight best entered with a big weapon like a great club or great sword since nothing beats taking down hordes of skellies with ease. It's a total power trip which isn't something Dark Souls games like to give you too often. It's a small reprieve from the usual relentless brutality, which is welcome if done sparingly. It's also nice how all three of the lords have unique movesets. You've got the pyromancer, the scythe guy, the works. The arena not only looks cool, but is great for crowd control if need be, not to say that you really do most of the time. I also like their thrones, they're kinda like lifeguard chairs except made out of human bones and in a murder cave instead of a pool. So weak difficulty aside, this fun little waterfall romp is a moment I'm sure to enjoy every playthrough, and I'll stand by this till the day I die. Alana, the queen of a dirty, smelly, and unpleasant place resulting from poverty and neglect, was a shockingly good fight. All I have to say is, the Sanctum City, or as I like to call it, the Sanctum Shitty Bunch, posts up on all of those adjectives, especially smelly because the enemies in the run up fucking stink. I don't know what foul, fiendish, repulsive, abhorrent, not enough words to describe asshole decided to make unkillable poison sniper statues and poise god short sword NPCs, but whoever you are, know that, um, I don't like you. Online threads make you look like a bitch, and you know what else does? When a boss summons a boss as a phantom with the same stats, no padding, just a boss fight in a boss fight. As I just described in fantastic detail, Alana has a super cool or not so cool Russian roulette mechanic. Throughout the fight, in the midst of her pyromancy and hex flurry, she summons either skeletons, piglets, or velstat, all based on random chance. The skellies are most common and easiest to deal with, they go down in a few hits and there's only three. Second in spawn rate is velstat, and I'd like to say he only comes in at the end, as for me, he's never been the first, second, or even third summon, which may be good luck or good development. And lastly, the piglets are totally harmless and a fun little gimmick, hence why they're the rarest, but to me they exist as a funny thought that she had like a summoning malfunction or something. Speaking of, there had to be a mistake in her damage output, cause she hits like a friggin' freight train. All of her hex attacks do considerable amounts of damage, even to 50 plus bitch vigor builds, and her staff is even worse. It's cool though, she has a wide variety of attacks and the teleportation mechanic spreads out the moveset to give it more of a surprise component. She frequently swaps places, most of the time behind you or out of your vision, so you're constantly one step behind to make up for the fact that she can't move. As the first of three bosses in the Crown of the Sunken King DLC, Alana shined in many aspects, not only because she was really good after a painful 45 building up, but thanks to her unique range of moves and powers, she stands out from the average humanoid boss battle. I'm going to start out by saying the Pursuer has one of the most badass intro cutscenes out there. I know some people groan and moan about the bloodshot eye effect the cutscenes have in Dark Souls 2, but I actually really like it and it shines the most here. 
You've got the rare cutscene shaky cam when his massive sword hits the ground and he's just straight to business. He's got one job, kill any undead he comes across, and he's got his mind set. This character type is one of my favorites, sort of a doom slayer or guts like mentality. Plus I haven't talked enough about his sword yet, which is not just awesome looking but one of my favorite weapons to use as well. The fight is pretty fun too, which is a nice early game gem you don't see too often in games. He's obviously not too hard and can be flat out trivialized by strafing constantly to the right, but he's still got some serious presence. His curse thrust attack is a neat flashy move and his combos demand the perfect level of skill from a beginner to avoid. You can kill him with the ballista if you're feeling cheeky, although doing that always makes me feel like a cheater. All in all, the pursuer's general coolness and fun are a surefire recipe for cracking our top 10. Yeah, I'll say it right off the bat, f*** that run up. It's second only to the frigid outskirts and not that far behind. You need to go through a minimum 9 Elan Knights and the 1 Elan Captain just to even enter the fog gate. Luckily enemies despawn after I think 7 deaths, but the smelter demon isn't even that hard so for the veteran one go should do the trick. The smelter demon's fight is split up in 3 phases. For about the first quarter of his health, he's got no add-ons or anything of note, he's simply got a badass fight with a rock and move set. His swings are fast paced and high damage, but also have fair windows for Estus and returns, and one attack that it serves you well to remember is the sword plunge. It's pretty unique in that it's a 2 for 1, sometimes he forks the ground and is a sitting duck and other times he delays a little longer, shrugs his shoulders in prep and launches a massive AoE that most likely one shots depending on your vigor. At about 75% health, he finishes off a low fiber dookie and gains passive fire damage that fans out from his torso. Normal life gems cancel out the damage for the most part, but do keep track because as long as you're in hitting distance you're also taking damage and paired with greed it can stack up. And you know how in certain fights during a pause like say Velstat they take less damage? Yeah, for the rest of the fight he takes about half of what you hit during phase 1. This makes it a serious chess game and helps build up for the third phase. Phase 3, while short, is the best part of the fight and my favorite moment of the first half of the game. He literally guts himself with his own sword in desperation and it gains added damage plus fire streaks on certain attacks, for example the forward slam. And the music is one of those tunes that messes with nerves as well, the timing is damn near perfect in sync with the third phase and meshes great with the fact that you're probably out of Estus due to the fire and mixed with the overall increase in defense and damage it is quite the tense few moments. As one of the few early game gems in Dark Souls 2, the Smelter Demon's intense, purely skill based fight is worthy of a top 10 slot. Despite its track records of mortifyingly bad dragon fights, the Soul series managed to help its abysmal record out a little bit with this fight, dropped a little while after Souls 2's initial release. This fight did its job as a finale to the Sunken King DLC pretty well, with stats well suited to endgame and no attacks that feel unfair. The poisonous clouds his attacks leave behind don't build up fast enough to feel obnoxious, but feel more like a temporary means of area denial. This is a feature that makes the fight more memorable in my opinion, and could have easily gone wrong if FromSoft didn't balance it so well. He for the most part acts how you'd expect a dragon to, flying around and sending flames at you. He does have his unique twist to add to the formula though, like his signature poison and fireball move. He also caught me off guard with his dive move once, which actually made me laugh while I was playing due to how sudden it was. I really thought I'd have more to say on Sin, but I can't think of much else. I just always have a good time going up against him and think he was a great way to cap off the awesome Sunken King DLC. I'd say this is the upset of the channel so far. Nobody ever gives this dude anything other than flack and we don't get why. Like the old Dragon Slayer, sure he's lazy but at least it's a reverb over a reskin and again it's of a top 25 boss in the series so I mean yeah at least it wasn't like the covetous demon or something. Okay? I, I refute I guess. No but seriously there are changes, instead of dealing and having fire immunity the blue smelter demon is based in magic. And not that it means much but the iron passage version looks so much cooler. Lore wise, he looks this way because he's the original smelter demon that served as the old Iron King's puppet, and he used his sorcery powers to reawaken the other smelter demons such as the one in the Iron Keep. They share the same moveset, but Blueberry has added delays and negated timing which makes it a lot more of a thinking game than previous. 
And since he's an optional DLC boss meant for after the main game, he hits much harder, has a larger health pool, and in turn is more difficult, all things the original dearly needed. As an all around upgrade on an already fantastic boss, Alex and I will gladly be the first to not cave the community opinion and say the blue smelter demon is a very good, fun, and fair boss fight. I'm right off the bat just going to say that he looks totally awesome. He has a lot of things that I complimented the Four Kings for design wise such as the expressionless mask, but he also has his own twist like the thorns on his gear and to state the obvious his enormous mirror shield. But of course looking glass sounds way better and more original than mirror, so they went with that. This fight isn't just great by design alone however, it's got plenty of things that push it to elite status. It has an awesome arena, the top of Castle Dranglick at night with pouring rain and all that makes for a solid background and is complemented well by his lightning abilities. I like how he has variations of each move depending on your distance from him, such as opting at the end of a series of swings to go for either a spin move or launch some swirling electric orbs at you. His shield also adds some strategy to the fight, making you have to hit him from behind or his right side to get any damage in. His shield also summons either an invading player or an NPC fighter to help him out when he gets low which is another unique mechanic. For some reason he did this super late into my fight and I just sort of let him do it to show it off, but nonetheless an innovative idea. The cracks appearing on the shield before the dude jumps out are kind of satisfying to watch. I also like his boss theme, it's one of the more memorable ones to me personally. If he was faster and maybe a smidge more difficult, I'd probably have him in the top 3, but as is he still commands a respectable 6th place spot. I always thought an Aegis was like one of those cool medieval positions of power, but in definition it's simply a protector of a particular person. I gotta admit, that's kinda lame, but Velstat's still a badass, and it's a cool sounding name that matches the lore, as along with Rain, better known as Fume Knight, Velstat was one of Vendrick's personal guardians. Over time, Velstat and Fume Knight built up a larger disagreement and went to battle. Velstat defeated Rain, and Rain was deemed a traitor, sent off to exile at the bottom of Broom Tower. But by that point, Drangliak was put into disorder by Nashandra, so Vendrick retired to the Undead Crypt with his Royal Aegis at his side. Over time, both were consumed by Dark, and knowing there was no return, Velstat gave his life to the Order of the King, which is why we find him as the King's final defense in the Crypt. Velstat's moveset is based around a mixture of swings and Dark Miracles through use of his Sacred Chime Hammer, the only unblockable hammer in PvP, I think. On his reverse swings, he has very questionable lingering hitboxes that are a nuisance to work with, as the best strategy I've found is stab him in the ass. Like basically all humanoids in the game, he has no real way of defending his backside except to jump back or do the occasional rotation swing, so this is definitely the most viable way of taking him in the first phase. At around 60% health, he gets on one knee and proposes! No, in desperation he summons the dark he so avidly fought against and fully engulfs himself, gaining attacks such as the dark orb burst and an increase in defense similar to the smelter demon's buff. I have heard that it's possible to stagger him out of this, but I've never seen it done, nor do I think anybody can rack up that much damage considering his defense is like double during the animation. But yeah, as the first of the endgame bosses of Dark Souls 2, Velstat the Royal Aegis is exceptional in many departments, and along with lore importance is unquestionably one of the best fights in the game. It's a good thing the final boss of all those Dark Chasms is so awesome, since I would have thrown a fit otherwise. Dark Diver Grandal's human effigy sacrifice to open the portal is a pretty steep demand all to go through a dark area and light a torch, and doing that for a bum boss would have been a serious letdown. I think the main way the Dark Lurker excels is gameplay. The lore around him is pretty vague, his arena is nothing to call home about, and I don't really remember his theme, but damn if this fight isn't a fun one every time. As I said before, large arenas tend to improve fights in these games, and you've definitely got some legroom here. Some of his attacks are actually best dodged by running and even jumping, which I find really fun in Dark Souls 2 since you jump like an NBA All-Star. He's got some classic swings with pretty fair hitboxes, range, and speed, as well as a host of dark magic and even pyromancy. It's a manageable but not terribly notable fight until he goes and splits into two dudes. Here's where it gets crazy. With two Dark Lurkers in the mix, you have to constantly watch the skies for floating projectiles or lasers, as well as the ground for energy sword attacks. 
You get very little downtime, but it's never so unbearably pressuring that you can't find time to heal. So it hits that incredibly hard to nail balance of intensity and fairness where you always have adrenaline pumping from the skill demanded of you, but never the feeling of being overwhelmed by cheap tactics. It's not entirely against you either. For example, here I exploit the fact that there are two of them by hitting them both at once with my sword doing enormous damage with a single attack. Strategic positioning is a big one here, since you really do not want to be close to both of them at once for the most part. There are no pillars or obstructions, but they aren't terribly speedy at chasing you, so making distance is easy and feels natural. Meticulously crafted design like this is seldom found in this series in my opinion, with even some of my favorites having the rare stat balancing issue or two in my eyes. So I think this fight falls into the same camp as Artorias for me, where I really think there are no flaws with the gameplay. The entries above this mainly win from a more rounded resume of positives than the mechanically minded Dark Lurker, but this is still enough to earn him the title of best non-DLC boss. Like the other videos, we shared the same top 3 with a different order. Sir Alon here was the biggest point of controversy, as Alex had him at 2, I had him at 3, but with solid reasoning and factual evidence we mutually agreed that Sir Alon fits at the bottom of the top. Don't get me wrong though, this is one of the best fights in Soulsborne and I personally think it's a 10 out of 10, okay? Good, but here's why he gets beaten out. He has a minuscule moveset, and along with repetitive AI, never expands beyond the lunge, combo, and bleed stab. Alon gets cheesed by staying in mid-range, his AI gets constantly baited into forward lunging, then you roller strafe right and get hits. Then in between, you slowly back off by rolling backwards during his combos and repeat the cycle. From time to time, he'll do a cool cinematic drain attack where his sword gains dark and if it connects, it naturally buffs into a bleed infusion, and I do have to say, this is one of my favorite looking attacks in the game. He also has some other moves, like a jump stab and a dark energy slash, but I never get them, so that's more as a consolation. But moveset aside, this was the first time since Artorius it truly felt like a one-on-one -on -one with a warrior equal to you in skill, speed, and size. He moves at approximately the same speed as you, which creates fantastic intensity, all blended together by my personal favorite soundtrack in the game. It's cool in how rather than a battle fueled by rage and anger like Artorius, it's a graceful dance out of respect over fury. And it was meant to be that way. Alon once served the old Iron King, but witnessed his sires fall into depravity firsthand, causing him to eventually leave what would become the Iron Keep to find peace. And this is where you find him, in meditation, unwilling to fight, but accepting of honorary code. And his grace extends to even after the fight, he literally seppukus himself if you no know damage him, which is a beautiful nod to his Japanese style. As most people's final boss of the exceptional Crown of the Old Iron King DLC, Sir Alon broke expectations and boundaries for this game and exceeded all aspects of a boss fight done right. First things first, Fume Knight has the most awesome distinctive sword in the series in my opinion. If any of you guys have a contender to raise, please do by all means but I can't think of one off the top of my head that's as bulky and tough looking as the Fume Ultra Greatsword. Jack already gave a brief rundown on the Fume Knight back in his talk on Velstad, but a few forgot this guy is Raim, Vendrick's other guard who left to go with Nadalia, one of Manus' children. Which I guess would technically make him Vendrick's brother-in-law since he was married to Nishandra. Anyways, clearly hanging around the old Iron King's pad with Nadalia didn't domesticate him too much, since he can still kick some ass when you find him at the bottom of Broom Tower. It's worth noting that rushing in without staking the Bride of Ash idols around the arena pretty much dooms you to failure, since Nadalia will keep healing him from outside the arena, so definitely do that first. As for the fight itself, he's actually got two swords, the huge one everyone knows and a more nimble smaller one in his offhand. His heavy duty sword does most of the work as he horizontally swings it at you, but if he feels like some roll catching or quicker attacks he'll use the smaller one as well. He excels at punishing poor stamina management I would say since I myself often end up low from dodging all the swings and attacking too much only to be blindsided by his surprising speed. This is actually something not too common that I really like seeing since roll spam is heavily punished here, as well as not paying attention to the direction you should be rolling in. In phase 2 he lights his sword on fire, or something that looks like fire at least, and gets some extra range, damage, and moves. Here's where stuff gets real. You gotta be on your A game to come out on top and it's a great feeling when you overcome him knowing it was a victory well earned. He's a standout example of excellence in basically every category I think of when considering boss quality, making him a shoo-in for the top ranks.
This may come as a shocker to some, but the Burnt Ivory King is pure entertainment. Like I said in the Arkham videos, the best bosses have a mix of cinematic pageantry, intriguing backstories, dialogue or history that plays a role in the fight, a unique and definable arena, fair movesets and telegraphing that hones in on player skill over surprise movement and timely roll spam, and exceptional quality that gives a rush of adrenaline through high caliber difficulty. That should sound like an immeasurably long list of points to tackle, yet throughout the Souls games many bosses have achieved all those feats, some reaching above and beyond, such as our number one, the Burnt Ivory King. The Ivory King, past tense, pre-burnt, was a proud warrior of Ferosa and a good-hearted man who strongly opposed the spread of chaos and dedicated his life to that cause. He built Ilium Lois to safeguard the old chaos, and along with his Lois knights served guard to the city. He built the Grand Cathedral directly over the mouth of the chaos, even putting his throne right on top of where he would one day reside. Years later, Alzana, Silent Oracle, and Spawn of Manus came to Ilium Lois. She knew the king was in love with her, and it went both ways, so she came knowing he was in trouble. After spending so much time indirectly fighting the chaos, his strength and vigor had been mortally weakened to the point of no return. So as a final stand, he entered the mouth of chaos with his loyal Lois Knights at his side, never to return. And this is where you find him, all those years later, trapped in the eternal torment he fought so dearly against. Throughout what's left of Ilium Lois, there are three remaining Lois Knights who stayed, unscarred by the chaos. You can find them to help you in the fight, and all four, including the one already there, make it a lot more manageable. From the entrance onwards, it's a badass cinematic encounter, as when you first enter the throne room, the Lois Knights sturdy up and prepare to fight their last stand alongside the bearer of the curse, all in the name of ending the chaos. The drop down, while overdone in Souls 3, was a first in the series and such a memorable moment for all who experienced it for the first time. The arena is a vast ruin of an old building surrounded by infernal nether. There are three chaos portals that infinitely spawn charred Lois Knights opposite to the Lois Knights you fight alongside with, who are charred from chaos and have souls rotted in dark. They have high health but generally meager damage, and this is just such a cool moment, watching essentially brothers fight in a battle royale surrounded by a hellish landscape. And once there's an opening, the Lois Knights will sacrifice themselves one by one to permanently freeze the portals and prevent any more Charred Knights from spawning. And after a little while, in the grandest of entrances to date, the Burnt Ivory King enters the fray. By this point, there should be the one Lois Knight still alive, and he provides solid bait for free hits and heal windows, but the Burnt Ivory King slams his health, so don't tread lightly because he goes down pretty quick. The Ivory King's moveset is pretty typical for a humanoid in Phase 1, he's rocking a short blade and jumps around. But like all of the top 10, Phase 2 is when things heat up. He jumps back and slowly engulfs his sword in an unknown substance that I could be the first to say is officially called Super Sticky White Stuff. So yeah, the Burnt Ivory King buffs his sword with super sticky white stuff according to the Wikipedia that I definitely did not change. Nonetheless, the buff gives him longer reach, heavier damage, and faster swings, and he gains two new moves, those being a stab similar to Elan's and an ice AoE similar to the Rampart Golems found throughout the DLC. He's in this phase for the majority of the fight, and it's a total blast. He gives fair reprieve and is a constant burden, just a cherry on top for one of the greatest bosses in the Soulsborne series. Thank you all for tuning back in for the mid-ground of our 5-part Soulsborne boss ranking. As our longest video to date, we put in uncharted hours of blood, sweat, and tears, so a like would go a long way. Since Bloodborne is one less in boss count to this game, we're gonna need a while to get that out, so spare us if we take an extra week off. If everything goes accordingly though, the third tier list, this time the areas of Dark Souls Remastered, will be up next week and then we're taking a quote unquote week off afterwards, which means it's just a week where we work in the video. As always, if you're not subscribed, please do, and with all that said, Deuces.